Good afternoon. Game day, Friday night football. Carlton and St Kilda. I'll get to that shortly. But last night, if there was any doubt about Brisbane's premiership and final well, top four credentials, I think they put them to rest last night. 41-point winners over the Western Bulldogs. It was a pretty convincing display. Clearly, the Bulldogs were hampered by injury. I'll get to that shortly. But in terms of the top four, well, I guess there's uh, some questions regarding Brisbane's attributes at the MCG, but they might not have to go there until the grand final at this stage. It looks highly likely now they could finish in the top two. They're a game clear, equal top with the Demons. Second on the ladder this morning, the Lions. The Bulldogs are in an interesting position. They're ninth. They're equal on points with eighth, Richmond. But Collingwood, Richmond and St Kilda all have a game in hand and an opportunity to go clear, at least one game clear this weekend. Having said that, post-game, Bebo said he won't stop believing. It was like Journey, Don't Stop Believing, which is the final song, incidentally, in The Sopranos. They've got four of the next five games against sides above them, the Bulldogs on the ladder. So they're in an interesting position. In terms of some of the players they're missing, well, Smith's still not back, obviously suspended. English with concussion. Ed Richard with concussion could both be back next week. Caleb Daniels, an interesting one, a hugely important player, arguably, well, he might be the most important player for the Bulldogs. He's so consistent. He's had knee surgery this week on some cartilage damage, and there's no time frame on his return. But Brisbane were ultra, ultra impressive last night. Rudy Edsel just taking a picture of me for our uh, YouTube channel. I've just been to the infrared sauna this morning, so I'm in my exercise gear, in case you're wondering, watching our podcast today. Clayton Oliver yesterday signing a seven-year deal, which starts at around a million dollars a year, but it's linked, I've reported, to the total player payments and the salary cap, meaning in six or seven years, which is the last two years of the deal, he'll be 33, it'll be close to 2030. That deal could be worth $1.5 million plus per season. So the total value could easily be over $10 million, which should set Clayton up, or at least make him financially secure for the rest of his life. And he reflected on that yesterday in his interview. He said, look, it's been a bit of an emotional week in that regard. The significance of the achievement and the deal wasn't lost on Clayton, who in was in at the club yesterday swimming on the day off. He does a lot of extra work. It's no accident that he's arguably at the moment the best player in the competition. Obviously, long-term deals have been a bit on the nose post Brody Grundy. It'd be interesting interesting to see whether Colling would just sound out interesting Grundy at the end of the year. There's a bit of chatter around that, but certainly no firm guidance in that regard at the moment. But uh, they had been on the nose, but Melbourne clearly prepared to back Oliver, of all people, for that type of deal. That's what he commanded. They jumped in before the free agency, and as I mentioned, it's linked to the total player payments. What does it mean now for Jackson and Brayshaw? Well, in terms of Luke Jackson, I spoke to one top uh, trade boss this morning at one of the clubs, and their firm view is that Jackson is going home. Now, that's just a view, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. He's from Western Australia. I've interviewed his parents, actually, during grand final week over there last year. He's got a great family in Western Australia. Who could blame him? You know, he could be offered up to eight years at $10 million plus to go home, and it looks that way at the moment. Now, his preference, and I think Damien Barrett reported that on one of the Triple M channels this week, is, is Fremantle, but don't discount the Eagles, who clearly are going to have better picks to offer Melbourne. West Coast currently second last. Fremantle up the sharp end of the ladder. So clearly Melbourne would prefer to deal with West Coast instead of Fremantle. Having said that, players usually get their way. So there could be an arm wrestle in that regard. And don't discount the fact also that West Coast, they'd like to walk him. They could walk him in the pre-season draft for nothing if that's, uh, if that's the club he nominated. Look, I don't think it'll go down that path. And that would obviously put North Melbourne potentially in a position to get Jackson as well, which is, look, highly unlikely. But my point is there'll be negotiation and and a lot of discussion regarding that in the next couple of months. You know, what does all this mean for Melbourne? I wouldn't worry too much if you're a Melbourne supporter. I mean, the precedent with Jackson is someone like Jeremy Cameron. He got up to three first-round draft picks, so Melbourne could easily get at least two first-round draft picks in the end for uh, for Luke Jackson. They could easily get a first-round draft pick as well for Angus Brayshaw. So Melbourne, at the end of the year, might have an extra three first-round draft picks which, uh, I don't know, you could trade up and get the first pick if you wanted to. I mean, there's all sorts of permutations and and situations that Melbourne will contemplate and will obviously free up a huge amount of salary cap space. That's jumping the gun slightly, but my point is that uh, Melbourne could potentially, you know, in the end win out of this as well. So it might end up being a win-win. I can also report this morning that Jason Dover, I understand, Luke Jackson's manager, who's based in WA, works for TLA, was in Melbourne. I understand meeting with Tim Lamb, the Um, head list honcho at the Demons this morning. So those Jackson talks clearly at a uh, critical point. 
Um, but as I mentioned, I mean, certainly the view of some clubs this morning, the Jackson now is certainly going home. And uh, Jackson, well, look, it could turn into a win for Melbourne, but there'll be a lot of argy-bargy from a trade perspective over the next few months because clearly West Coast will have a lot more to offer and a lot more flexibility in terms of what they can offer Melbourne instead of Fremantle. I mentioned Friday night football, absolutely critical for St Kilda tonight. They're not giving much hope by a lot of the experts. Carlton obviously in superb form, but Brett Ratton has swung the axe up to five changes, but significantly, Ryder and Hill are both back in at the side for Carlton. No weedering yet, but Adam Chera is back. In terms of some other selection news this weekend, interesting one at the Cats. Danger's back, which is a bit of a surprise. We thought perhaps his calf just needed another week, but certainly there was the indication from Danger directly at the start of the week. He's been named at full forward, returning from this persistent calf issue. Selwood's been given a rest against North Melbourne. Certainly well-deserved one for the Pies and selection. Jordan Dugowie is back against the Suns. Talk about important games for the eight. If the Pies can beat the Suns, they could be up to two games clear inside the eight. Having said that, the Suns are arguably the informed team of the competition. Jeremy Howe, a massive out for Collingwood as well in terms of defence. So Dugowie comes in, Howe comes out. And I'll just finish with a couple of brief ones today. North Melbourne linked in an article in the Western Australian newspaper last night to interest in Adam Simpson. I'm told from North Melbourne's also top one, so there's gen- they genuinely haven't spoken to any other head coaches. There's a bit of chatter also around that uh, they could uh, target Mark Williams in terms of, I guess, a senior assistant or mentor around that group. He's obviously had huge success uh, Choco at R- Richmond as well now as Melbourne. He's a great mentor, particularly to some of the young guys, has them over for dinner, knows when to go firm on them, knows when to go soft on them, knows when to crack a joke, knows when to coach them. He was critical at times, I think, during Melbourne's grand final last year in terms of just settling the group at various points when the Bulldogs got in front. So I think so. I wouldn't be surprised if they look at Mark Williams at some stage, but I'm told genuinely haven't spoken to other head coaches from North Melbourne this morning. Look, I think in a practical sense, I think Simon Lethleen reflected on this, the incoming Saints CEO, currently their footy boss, earlier this week. When they formed a judgment about um, recontracting Brett Ratton, Brett Ratton, of course you look to the market. And North would be, I think, you know, in my opinion, negligent or derelict in their duties if they didn't go and sound out Adam Simpson. He's one of the most famous shin boners from their Halcyon period during the 90s. He's clearly a brilliant coach and his time at West Coast is sort of teetering a bit. So you'd be mad if he didn't at least for informally sound him out at some level. But that's the official word in that regard from North Melbourne this morning. And just briefly, the AFL CEO search continues. Continues. I think those interviews have started. I've reported on this podcast. I spoke to one club president yesterday who was of the view, and it's just one view, that uh, Andrew Dillon, the general counsel and footy boss at the AFL, is now in pole position to get that job. And there could be an, an announcement in that regard in the next month or so. Look, I don't know if it'll happen in the next month. And I don't know if it'll be Andrew Dillon, but I do think that uh, from the people I speak to, he's in a very, very good position if he wants it to get that job. Having said that, the AFL is running a very, very thorough process. I should just mention as well, I forgot to mention off the top, that there were a couple of injury blows again for Brisbane last night, including Zorko and Rich. So Zorko coming back, he had a 19-day hamstring, did it again last night. And uh, Rich also doing a similar injury. So that's a blow for the Brisbane Lions in that regard. But, geez, they were impressive last night. Don't forget to tune in to Triple M all weekend. It's going to be an absolutely bumper round of football. I'm looking forward to it all starting on Friday Night Football tonight. I'm speaking to Luke Sayers, the Carlton president for the news pregame. It'll be interesting to see what their position is on Tasmania and a couple of key contracts and just how he's turned the club around. He's done a brilliant job already with the Blues over the last 12 months, the incoming president or new president, Luke Sayers. It's going to be a belter of a weekend of football. Triple M rocks football. (laughs) 